Welcome back to DWeb Decoded, a podcast by Filecoin Foundation that explores the intersection of blockchain and the data economy. I'm your host, Aaron Stanley, and today I'm joined by Yair Klepper, who's the CEO and co-founder of Lava Network, which is enabling decentralized access to blockchains. Yair, thanks for being here today. Excited to be here, Aaron. So you guys are building decentralized RPC and data infrastructure for the blockchain world, and you're serving more than 40 different chains. You have 3 million monthly users, and you've handled about 90 billion RPC requests, uh, if I'm getting those numbers right from your website. Uh, So today we're going to be talking about all that, uh, but I would love for you to start by just taking a minute to introduce yourself um, and tell us about your background and why you co-founded Lava. For sure, yeah. I co-founded uh, Magma, Magma Devs, and I'm a contributor at Lava Network. Ah, okay, it's yes. Really <laughs> ecosystem. But uh, yeah, my background is uh, super techie. I uh, studied computer engineering, um, based, uh, born and raised in Israel, and uh, I was lucky to found uh, different startups since I was 21. Uh, I like your uh, uh, filter here. I, I, I guess I look younger, but... Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, it's been a, a, a very long journey for me. Uh, I was in fintech, retail, uh, business intelligence, even augmented reality, and last startup in supermarkets, um, which uh, all of those industries are craving for innovation. But uh, three and a half years ago, my co-founder dragged me to uh, Web3. He started by doing MEV bots and uh, NFTs and all these kind of different uh techy stuff. And uh, he caught my attention. He said, let's jump right in. And from the, from the get-go, we felt like um, the infrastructure is broken. How do you receiving data, read, write transaction is kind of limited and have a lot of um, drawbacks. So this is when we were started to think about Lava. And two and a half years ago, uh, we founded the, finally a Magma Devs and thought about Lava as kind of the data access layer that's going to scale, make much more resilient all data interaction in Web3. Got it, got it. So I have a couple of entry-level questions here that I'd like to go over just to kind of level set. And uh, for the non-technical folks in our audience, could you explain like what an RPC is and, and what an RPC provider does? Like, How would you explain that in, in like plain English? Yeah, for sure. So RPC is a remote procedure call. Aaron, what, what kind of languages do you speak? I speak English and Portuguese. Oh, nice. Uh, so I, uh, I, I currently in Lisbon. My Portuguese is ah. menos, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I speak uh, Hebrew, English, and a few sentences in a couple of other languages. So RPC is kind of the language of blockchains, right? It's the mechanism that lets uh, the apps and wallets interact and connect with the blockchains, right? Uh, checking what are the balances, if you want to swap tokens, if you want to, uh, f- you know, fetch uh, transactions or really um, mint an NFT token, airdrop, all this kind of stuff, request to speak with the blockchain themselves. And today, um, until Lava was, uh, you know, started to... Um, uh, during the mainnet, so there were like a RPC providers, uh, single providers that providing those services uh, and really reduce the barrier to entry. You think about Alchemy, QuickNode, Block, uh, Block Demon, and they really reduce the barrier to entry to start. But um, they also caused some other uh, drawbacks. Uh, you know, think about single point of failure, censorship, and even uh, manipul- uh, manipulation of the data. So um, Lava started as a decentralized RPC to make sure that you have 100% uptime and resilience, uh, you have a permissionless access, and really the principles and the values of Web3 are fulfilling here. Got it, guys. So, so basically, like the way that you interact with a blockchain, uh, irrespective of what chain it is, is essentially the same, right? There's there's kind of the read write components, and there's the data fetching components to it. Uh, but each each chain, uh, the process is basically the same, but each chain kind of has its own separate language, right? And then, so to access that that respective chain, you would need to like speak the language of that chain, which would be like running a node on that chain, right? So the alter, so you could either run the node yourself. Uh, which 
um, most people like surprisingly in the blockchain world, like, like don't really want to do, uh, I would like to ask you about that. Like why this is maybe not as commonplace as it might, you know, people might think it would be, or you can use one of these kind of like node as a service providers, right. Uh, essentially like these, these, like these alchemies or these types of folks. Um, but like, I mean, am I understanding that correctly? Like that's, those are sort of your yeah, options. Yeah. If you are, you, you were, uh, I want you to keep going, but, uh, you know, oh, if <laughs> I put the pin in it, you know, when you today surfing the web, you, you typing www.google, uh, you have no idea where the website is stored, right? Where is the storage? What's, um, what's, uh, the HTTP version it's using, you know, even what's TCP IP, if it's, uh, you know, based on AWS, on GCP, uh, North America, and all of these kind of questions that the internet today abstracted from the end user. But today in Web3, unfortunately, we need to know those answers if we want to interact with the blockchain. So Lava kind of creating a decentralized marketplace, starting with RPC services and connecting everyone that has access, those are the node providers or node operators, with consumer developers, uh, wallets, blockchains, and connected them in order to receive a high performance uh, service. In every of these marketplaces or pools, um, there are incentives that uh, you know rewarding the participants. They're ensuring like high quality services, uh, uh, speed, uptime, accuracy, all of this stuff are happening because the demand and supply is kind of balanced. So today, Lava supports more than 40 blockchains with this scalable infrastructure. But, um, you know, um, dozens of new blockchains are coming very soon. Well, yeah, well, that's, that's the thing. It's like we are entering this multi-chain world, right, where it's it's like anybody anybody and everybody can spin up their own chain, right, uh, on, on any of these, on multiple different ecosystems, right? Um, and I guess one question I have is like, like, why is it that people in in the Web3 world, like, they generally don't want to run their own nodes? Like, why Like why is it that, that people, we've come to rely on, uh, you know, either a centralized RPC provider, like an Alchemy or somebody, or, or even like a centralized provider like yourself. Like, like why is it that folks in Web3 have just been sort of uh, reluctant to, to, I mean, it's all about, well, Web3 is kind of all about like, like owning, you know, kind of owning everything yourself and being able to do it all yourself, right? It's so like, why are people so reluctant to maybe run their own nodes? Well, you know, it starts with uh, mechanism, with the incentivation, I would say. Um, it goes through, it's very difficult today because uh, we live in a multi-chain world, right? There are hundreds and thousands of different blockchains. How do you support nodes in each and every one? And it continues with the user experience. The same way you, when you're surfing the website, you don't know the answer to the question asked, asked before. Why do you need to implement your own private cloud, right? You don't need. So that's the abstraction that uh, we're trying to do uh, with Lab. Got it. Got it. And, and I know that there's other types of public RPC options available as well. And, um, I, I know like some of these are maybe there's some problems inherent with some of these that, that, um, that you guys are, are basically trying to improve upon. So I was hoping you can maybe, maybe describe like what some of these issues are and then like, what are, what is Lava kind of doing differently here? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, imagine Lava as, uh, you know, a four sided marketplace uh, permissionless. So if you're running already a node, you can monetize your existing infrastructure and receive rewards based on the quality of service. Uh, imagine, you know, uh, we always say Uber for nodes, right? So imagine that Uber drivers can monetize their existing car uh, when they're offering rides. At, at the end of the ride, the, the passenger is rating the service. That's exactly how the on-chain scoring mechanism works. And it allows every ride to be scored. Um, obviously, on blockchain, it's, uh, it's done automatically. And the passenger, or here the data consumer, is signing the transaction and sends all the different parameters, the speed, the uptime, latency, um, to the node providers, because the node provider wants to receive the rewards based on the service. So um, that's opening on the two other fronts, like we have the data consumers and we have the uh, node runners. Uh, another, of course, is the validators that securing the blockchain 
And uh, another, another person here or another actor here is the champions that can define new uh, blockchains, that defining new, um, those of data primitives, defining those pools and making sure that they have, you know, uh, uh, update and, uh, and incentives in order to make sure that all this marketplace is, is going and, you know, the most important thing, smoothly. Got it. So you, you've basically kind of got this, uh, you know, this sort of like this, this chicken and egg problem, right? Where like you've got the same thing with Uber, right? Where you're trying, you, like you need the drivers to be able to service the passengers. And if, and if you don't have any passengers, you're not gonna have any drivers, right? So in your case, you've got both like, you know, the node runners, then you've got the, like the end users, uh, like the, you know, the, the dApps, the wallets, the, you know, the chain, the various chains and whatever. So you, you've got kind of like, you know, you've got a sufficient quantity of both of those, uh, both of those pools, essentially. Is that, is that correct? Exactly. And, and, and your next question is, so who's starting this chicken and egg problem, right? And this is how Lava figured that the most interesting point to start is within the public RPC, right? Public RPC is something that every chain has, inviting dApps to build on top of them. So uh, in the beginning of the year, the Lava Foundation announced those incentive pools with Near, Axelar, Evmos, and soon with Filecoin, Starknet, and, and so forth. And those chains understand that Lava is a public good. So they in, they incentivizing and putting incentives on those pools so the node runners can join and provide service. Uh, at the end of every month, based on the quality of service, the nodes receiving rewards. And this is how you, <clears throat> sorry, you incentivize a very healthy mechanism that actually makes a very basic uh, operation, which is um, you know, making sure that the read-write the data is seamless. And it solves the problem for some of these chain ecosystems too, because they obviously want more nodes operating in their ecosystem, right? For questions of 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 like decentralization, right? Obviously, if your chain's running only a handful of nodes, then you're not very centralized, right? So having more nodes available, um, uh, uh, you know, solves that issue. And if there's and more then, needs, you know, more nodes are joining, incentives are higher, and so forth. That's interesting. And so, uh, so up until today, like you were mentioning, that this this service has been really provided historically by some of these like larger kind of centralized entities that have kind of spun like your Infuras or Alchemies or these folks that have you know seeing a need or seeing that there's a there's a, a, a like a, a demand for this type of service, like they spun up an operation. But you were mentioning that there's um, you know some issues inherent with like this, these some of these centralized um, of service providers, and I was I was wondering if you maybe like expand a bit on what some of those issues are. I think, um, you know, I think you mentioned like censorship, right? There's some issues like there's like, there's like uptime. There's a few of these other, um, you know, kind of, kind of like issues that you're, you know, it's not, not dissimilar to like using AWS or something, right? You're kind of at the mercy of this one single service provider. Could you maybe expand a bit on, on what some of those, uh, issues might be? Yeah, for sure. Look, I think in general, when the initial idea of blockchain is that everyone running its own node, right? <clears throat> not your, you know, not your node, not your data. Um, you, they kind of realize that um, when there is only Ethereum or Solana, it kind of makes sense. But then there is a boom of different chains, different network, different data primitives. Um, nobody can really provide services for that. Nobody can really um, make sure that once there is like we see those days, there's a lot of traffic, there's a lot of volume, there's a lot of need. So the, some of the services are hot. Uh, blockchain is a very, very uh, complex creature, right? So, um, um, uh, so you know, usually what happens is dApps don't want to uh, uh, trust a single point of failure, it's called, right? To trust only one provider. So they go to other provider and re receiving also, uh, um, you know, um, uh, quotes for how much it's going to pay. Maybe they implementing kind of a load balancer, disaster recovery, backups, and suddenly you see a replication of the same architecture for each and every DAP. Doesn't make sense, right? The DAPs have limited resources, and they want to make sure that you know they spending their resources on their business developing their own technology stack why they need to do it in 
you know, DevOps or, um, you know, pay different providers. And this is exactly what Lava is solving. It creates the same mechanism for data honesty, for data accuracy, for the uptime, but without the need, with, with implementing one line of code. And uh, you see, there are different other issues that, you know, um, uh, we, we could see during uh, this time, like uh, um, uh, Polygon, um, uh, some, uh, some nodes in one of the single providers that were uh, hacked and presented false information to the end users. And I guess, mm-hmm. you know, when we're speaking right now, there are also kind, such kind of scams and stuff like that. So our idea from the get-go was to minimize or even make it obsolete um, to, for such a problems from such a scams to happen. And that was the general idea. Um, first, scalable infrastructure and resilient. DApps, when they receive more service, they don't need to think, oh, we need to spin more nodes. When they trust Lava, they know that they have the access to any blockchain they want. And if they go to a new blockchain, like all the successful dApps, they don't need to receive more quotes because Lava is supporting most of the blockchains that develop. Well, that's, what's, that's what I find super interesting here is that you, you've kind of created this on-ramp uh, into this whole world of, of the multi-chain uh, universe, right? Where if I'm a dApp and I'm operating on, you know, say if I'm operating on Near, since I think you mentioned them earlier, uh, and I want to expand that and I want to go over to like Filecoin or I want to go to, you know, one of the Ethereum L2s, like I can, you know, it, without, without like a sent, without a, you know, a, a, a RPC using an RPC provider, I would need to go and like run my own node for each of these uh, chains basically, which is obviously quite cumbersome. Um, or I could go through, you know, using some of these public, you know, public services, which we talked about before, or I can go through what you're offering, which is kind of like a one-stop shop that gives uh, the, the DAP essentially access to all of these different, these different chains. Right. And, um, and you have, you know, the low latency, you have like reliability kind of built into it to making sure that the data that's being retrieved is, is, um, is, is like, is, is valid and is reliable is, is correct. Right. That's obviously a big thing. And then you also have the resiliency component built in too, where you're not dependent on one single service provider that could go down or could, you could censor you or whatever, you know, whatever might happen. Um, so that's that's like maybe just talk a bit about how one, one, you know, more, with, one more point oh, to add because you yeah, just I just realized that one one thing is is missing but also from the beginning was not clear to us sometimes for for many in uh, many ecosystem the community is the super user is the super technical user that anyway running the nodes think about archival nodes um, you know uh, historical notes, like you need specific data types that somebody that built part of that, that was the only contributors, they know how to get access and they know how to make it flawless. So we realized that the same way as Uber, they, those people that are running the nodes are not you know, reputable entities, but many times they provide service much better than the, uh, those entities themselves. So in the ecosystem that Lava is operating since the beginning of the year, there are reputable node runners that receiving thousands of, you know, of dollars and more per month, and they provide the best service. And you never heard about them. Why? Because they are, they are in love <laughs> and they are super uh, thorough with the, the, the tech stack and know how to do all the all kind of the operation and development that brings the right data according to the demand. And this is what uh, one of the CMOs of the ecosystem we work with uh, just told me. Basically, this budget, this public good budget is going back to the community. Interesting. And then so this is kind of a dumb question, but uh, like prior to this, no, I mean, did you find dumb answers? But yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, okay. I feel better now, but asking my, my uh, you know, not very intelligent question, but I mean, prior to this, was it the case that, that there was just a surplus of node operators that, that they, I mean, they had the infrastructure set up, but there was no incentive for them to just run the node base. I mean, the same with like Uber, like there's a surplus of cars, but there's just, just no reason for people to go around 
giving rides with their cars because there's no there's no way to like monetize it right is that kind of the same situation there was like there's a there's an excess supply of, of node of people that are operating these nodes but there's just no reason or there's no way for them to easily monetize it is that what you found you know it, it differs from ecosystem to ecosystem in some ecosystem huge you know very uh, that uh, that going for a long time see that dozens of different providers but we also see that sometimes the dozens of providers that were at the beginning when the incentive pool uh, just formed is going down. On the other, uh, the other hand, we see that ecosystem that more new, and at the beginning they have a smaller number of node runners. Um, after a few months, the number is going higher. And this is what is so beautiful, I think, about the uh, how blockchain uh, and uh, is uh, monetizing the utility and how Lava is using that. Because it's all about the supply and demand. At the end of the day, if you have utility, if there are incentives, if there is usage of the network, everyone going to be happy. And we see that more and more happening now. I, I hope it's kind of answering your question. Yeah, yeah, no, it makes it, yeah, it makes sense that it would be different. There, the supply and demand is going to be unique for every ecosystem, right? Because each 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 ecosystem is obviously its own thing, right? It's not you know it's not necessarily generalizable. Um, and, and some people at the beginning, you know, they they were asking me, so how much node you need? You need one thousand node. You need one node. You need five hundred thousand. Like at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. And that's one of the points that is very important for me to convey. Um, we are not here building decentralized RPC because of the altruism of decentralization. The infrastructure, when we started, was shit, simply like that. And it was very cumbersome, as you said, to start spinning new nodes, a new, a new ecosystem, and that was three years ago, right? Two and a half years ago. Think about now, you see like hundreds of different tokens and the ecosystem that are, um, that are showing up now. How are you gonna support this? This is the only way with incentivizing the right part of the community to build and maintain those nodes. So then how does a service uh, like, like what you guys are providing uh, make it easier for, for blockchain ecosystems to like monitor and, and manage their node infrastructure and, and associated costs? Like what, what does this provide them that maybe they didn't have before using, um, you know, maybe using another, another type of provider? So it doesn't matter if you are a, you know existing uh, ecosystem or you know an up and coming one. Once you're in a testnet, you start reaching out to RPC provider and you ask them, "Can you run the nodes for us?" What they are doing so far is going to those different uh, node runners and asking quotes and saying, "Oh, I think I need 50 uh, requests per second. No, I need 100 uh, thousands requests per per day, or uh, like different kind of metrics that." Everyone is pricing a bit different. At the end of the day, they're always working with, uh, you know, three or 10 different RPC providers, giving grants, uh, incentivizing the validators that sometimes vol voluntarily are joining those kind of uh, uh, public RPC pools. And at the end of the day, they don't know what they're paying for. They don't know what is the quality of service, what's the downtime, uh, you know, what is the latency and why they need to pay such a high integration cost from the get-go. That's exactly the problem that we didn't start Lava with, but after one, uh, one year of testnet, ecosystem approach us and say, look, you are public good. Take this burden away from us. Make mm. sure that we can spin out, um, uh, spin off, sorry, the, um, um, the layer, the data access layer in a matter of minutes, put incentive and invite providers to join. So making sure that they making a good service and they receiving rewards based on the service. Well, that's super interesting. So, so you found that folks are immediately interested in this, like, wow, if we can get out of this rat race of kind of throwing money at various, uh, you know, uh, RPC providers and, and, and not really being sure what we're actually getting in return, uh, you're providing them a bit more of like a, 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 you know, a bit more like a bit more transparency and a bit more of like an open market for this sort of thing. Uh, people are, are pretty receptive for that. And also saving costs. At the end of the day, <clears throat> we find a lot of ecosystem that ended up running their own nodes. Again, they don't need to do that, but they're afraid that the nodes are going to go down and then dApps are not able to build 
on the ecosystem. But now, you know, we see, we show, for example, at near 100% uptime in the last six months. We wow. saw, show other, you know, crazy, very, with a lot of traffic ecosystem that uh, their service now is flawless. And we saw that, we saw that um, also the, the incentive, those infrastructure budget is becoming a bit sexy, right? You see suddenly community node runners are joining and they receive rewards. They do a great service, so why not? And at the end of the day, it's not about the reputation of the provider, is what actually they're giving service for. Right, right. Yeah, at the end of the day, like the, the service has to be high quality. Otherwise, none of this other stuff matters, right? Exactly. Uh, so maybe kind of uh, stepping up big picture here. Um, I mean, how do you see this ultimately? I mean, the service that you've, you guys have built up here, how do you see this ultimately like really facilitating, you know, this multi-chain world that we are, uh, supposedly entering into, I don't know, the, the pundits all say we're entering a multi-chain world, I guess. So, but like everyone says it, right. It's a, it's a fun talking point, right. But how, I mean, how does what you guys are building here really like help facilitate that? So the simple answer to that is that Lava is abstracting the complexity of the multi-chain development. It's allowing the apps to build and to get data access on any supported blockchain with a single endpoint. So imagine one line of code and they get access to any, any blockchain out there. Um, the second thing is that the decentralized infrastructure is um, with that lava ensuring that smaller chains and new rollups, uh, L1s, L2s, they have equal access to high quality RPC services. Um, because if you are a smaller chain that doesn't you know, have huge budgets, it doesn't matter their budget. You can start with 20K, with 50K, with 100 It doesn't matter. Once you put incentive, providers joining, and they want to provide better service. And the third thing is about the scalable and permissionless infrastructure. Uh, when we see, especially nowadays, Web3 growth, um, we think about innovation cannot exist, and doesn't talk about coexist, on centralized systems. So you think about more complex data types, not only RPC, APIs, uh, indexing, subgraph oracles, AI, all of those primitives, at the end of the day, they need data. And if you're not able to provide them a quality data with the time they want, so um, you cannot continue building. And then if I can ask one more sort of uh, elementary level question here, technical question, but how, do, how does, since you mentioned like the, like, uh, like the indexing, like how, how does what you guys are doing differ from say like what, like the graph and some of these other like have data indexing protocols, uh, maybe just for us like non-technical folks who are trying to understand how this whole stack works. So the graph is doing for a long time great service by incentivizing um, different nodes, runners to... Um, kind of index the data, but they don't solve the question, how do they get the data from? I'm not speaking about the indexing. So mm -hmm. first, just remember, first uh, function is to receive the data, the raw data, account balance, gas fees, um, what are the history of, like all of this data, it's the raw data. Afterwards, you make indexing. So they, they solved with, you know, they have other protocols doing the same, but they are the first one who try to solve how do you index the data. Uh, like Chainlink brings the, you know, the Oracle's data. But what about the more elementary level of RPC that so far nobody solves that? Got it, got it. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, and then to round out here, I'd like to just talk about Filecoin for a bit. And I know that Lava, I know you guys have been doing uh, some work with Filecoin. Uh, there's an integration coming up, or maybe it's already live. I'm not entirely sure. But wondering if you could maybe talk a bit about that relationship. And then like, what's, uh, what are you guys kind of bringing to the Filecoin ecosystem here? Yeah, definitely. So Filecoin gave the, you know, the Lava incentive pool, the you know, pool incentive of uh, $25,000 for three months. And um, this is exactly uh, about to replicate the same success, hopefully, that we see in other ecosystems. Um, node providers can join and receive the rewards. Um, up to today, more than $300,000 in revenue already distributed to different providers and risk takers, right? 
So when you think about Filecoin, you think about the data layers, right? You think about uh, AI agents and all this kind of stuff um, that Lava was helping with Near, with Axela, with Evmos, Cosmos, Stargaze, and, and more. Uh, so the same thing is coming to Filecoin to make sure that the data access is, you know, is working flawless. Awesome. And then, um, and maybe can you talk a bit about like just what that was, what were some of the tangible benefits that that's going to bring, uh, like to the ecosystem, to the various, uh, you know, the storage providers or, or data clients or whomever else, you know, might be interacting with the, the chain in some fashion, like what are, what are, like, how can they expect their sort of, you know, day-to-day, -day, uh, operations to be, you know, improved or, or, or better? Yeah, of course. So, um, you know, first of all, the, the Filecoin incentive pool is already live, right? So imagine that you have <clears throat> new DAP that is building on top of Lava and, um, um, you know, building on top of Filecoin and they are going to, you know, need, they see suddenly, you know, a, a, a increase of the transactions, of uh, the, the, the request they need for the data. Um, so eventually, if they use Lava, automatically uh, they can rest assured that they don't need to go to different providers and or develop this kind of, you know, uh, the load balancing we spoke before. Um, so everyone that, um, you know, let's, let's take an example like a wallet uh, that is doing transactions, right? A user in the wallet are doing transactions, they swaps, they do staking. Um, and if it's based on Filecoin, this wallet, is using the endpoint of Lava, they can rest assured that they're not going to get an error or the transaction didn't happen and so forth. That's that's super interesting. Um, well, appreciate, uh, Yair, you coming on the show to, to tell us about all this stuff, really interesting work you guys are doing and um, appreciate uh, what you're contributing to the Filecoin ecosystem as well. Um, I'll give you the last word here, but uh, we'll love any final thoughts from you. And then how can folks uh, find you if they want to reach out or, or learn more? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, I've seen, uh, I, I was just in Filecoin Day at um, in DevCon, and I was lucky also to speak and present what Lava is doing. There's a lot of excitement, I see, because um, the reputation, I guess, that Lava is bringing from different ecosystem. And there was a lot of, uh, there, there were a couple of projects, I see a lot of projects about AI, but a, a few projects that was speaking uh, 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 to me, about Lava as the data layer for AI agents, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So think about AI agents, they are thriving on the data, right? And if the infrastructure is seamless, right? They have the RPC, APIs. So this can allow the AI agent to access, retrieve, interact with uh, the on-chain on data seamlessly, right? And uh, the AI agent also, they need this kind of open and decentralized system to operate autonomously, right? Uh, so if we think about that crypto provide this foundation, so Lava can serve as the data li layer that enabling this kind of uh, interaction. And I'm super keen uh, about specific project that hopefully now, uh, soon going to be uh, published. Um, about uh, the training, how Lava can uh, deliver, you know, multi-chain data access, and what is the actual operation? Uh, I, I believe that using Lava can cut, you know, between thirty to fifty percent of the cost that anyway you use in order to, you know, use uh, AI agents or execute on-chain transactions and uh, so forth. So. Um, you know, um, I'm very, I'm very curious to see what kind of added value we bring to the Filecoin ecosystem. No, that's amazing. Um, no, yeah, you really appreciate your time. Um, appreciate every, everything you're doing, and and uh, yeah, you, I think definitely keen to see what kind of value you guys are able to facilitate and unlock in uh, in, in Filecoin land. So, really appreciate everything, and um, thanks for coming on the show here. And then, uh, thanks for everyone for watching. We'll see you next time on DWeb Decoded. Thank you, Aaron. Pleasure to be here.